from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Jonas Hasenkimiri and his debut novel, Ett öga rött, One Red Eye, hit the Swedish literary scene in 2003 and was praised for its comment on the present and changing society with its playful language, humor, satire, and fast pace. Ever since then, Jonas has received a number of awards for his novels, for his short stories and plays in Sweden and abroad. He has now written four novels and six plays, and the latest play, Everything, no, the latest novel, Everything I Don't Remember, was awarded with the Sweden's most prestigious literary prize, the August Prize, named after Strindberg, of course. Jonas Hasenkimiri often shifts perspectives in his writing and invites the reader to come and play with him and, his, uh, and to play with his electrified language of his own that even got a name for itself called Kimirian. His work has been translated into 23 languages and his plays have been performed by over 100 companies around the world. Right now, his play, I Call My Brothers, is staged at the Forum Theater here in Washington, and it runs until October 1st, so you better hurry. A couple of years ago, Jonas wrote an open letter to the Minister of Justice in Sweden, who had publicly defended racial, racial profiling in the subways of Stockholm. It was called Dear Beatrice. It came, became the most shared piece in Swedish social media history, with 250,000 shares only the first day. And it started a Twitter movement where people under the hashtag Dear Beatrice started sharing their own stories. Jonas encourages us all to look behind the surface, behind our prejudices, and behind our fear. You can all support the festival with a gift of donation, and the festival would not be possible without the support of sponsors and book lovers. Just a few more things. Please turn your cell phones off. And I also want to tell you that a Q&A will follow after Jonas' talk. So save your questions. Also be aware that if you ask questions, you will be filmed for the archives. And that you can meet Jonas also after the talk when he will do a signing starting at 4.30. Now. Please join me in welcoming from Sweden, Jonas Hassan Kimiri. Does that work? Even though I'm too tall for this podium. Does it, do you hear me okay if I speak like this? Great. So thank you very much for that um, very kind introduction, Linda. Um, I do have to say, if my mother is watching this, that she was not a librarian, but um, uh, she was a psych physiotherapist, and she was very much a lover of books. Um, I have some kind of of idea of how I'm going to structure this. Um, the plan is that I will start to talk a little bit about memories and what memories do to us. And I will do that because the, my latest novel that was published in the States is called Everything I Don't Remember. Um, a few years ago, I went to my grandmother's house and I started finding these kind of weird, small handwritten notes. Um, I would go there every weekend, and I would visit her, and I would see small scribblings in her house. So what she, um, the first thing I th found was like small yellow post-it notes where she had written like salt on the uh, box where she kept salt, or sugar, uh, on the sugar um, uh, sugar box, and um, I, kind of, I was kind of taken aback. I wasn't sure what she was doing because I, I recognized her handwriting. My grandmother was a retired uh, teacher of Swedish, so she had this very 
uh, antiquated and, and uh, beautiful handwriting. Um, after one, I realized that she was writing these kind of small notes as a way to try to find stability because her memories were slowly starting to fade. Um, I specifically remember once when I got there and she had written uh, two uh, post-its on her phone and on her remote control because they looked so very similar. So on the phone she had written phone and on the remote control she had written TV because I realized when she was watching TV and someone would call her um, she often tried to respond in the remote you know, or if she tried to um, uh, raise the volume, she tried to use the phone. So these electronic devices were a little bit too similar, so she had to separate them by using her um, words. And um, this shift, when, when the memory started fading, it went really quickly for her to start to um, become more and more insecure about who she was and, and who we were, who were surrounding her. Um, the next step was that she, uh, I, was, I would be at home sleeping and I would wake up in the middle of the night and she would, uh, I would see that it was my grandma calling me at like two or three in the morning uh, and I would always respond because I would be a little worried, you know, something might have happened and um, always when I responded she was so happy, that was her first reaction, like extreme joy and she was like, Jonas, are you awake? And I was just, well, not really, you know. <laughs> she was good because that meant that she was not, you know, awake by herself. And then she, her next thing was that she just wanted to check um, whether or not my number was my number. So she said, she said the number that she had just dialed and just wanted to check that that was me. And I said, yes, that's me. And she said, thank you. Then I can go back to sleep feeling a little bit more comforted. So she used the languages and the numbers in order to find some kind of uh, stability. Um, that summer, she became a little bit unsure who I was. In the fall, she, um, for the first time I went there and she saw me and became afraid seeing me because she didn't recognize me at all. And in the spring, she could not stay in her house, so we had to um, move her to uh, a house for people with uh, dementia. And this experience has created this question of who we are without our memories. Because of course, that was my grandmother. Like every time I went there, I could see that she looked the same. She had the same facial features, the, sh the same perfume. We talked about the same things. She was a, since, since, since she was a retired teacher, she had very clear ideas about everything. Um, especially how to reform the school system. She knew exactly how to do that. Uh, she also had quite a lot of um, opinions about my authorship and my writing. Um, I remember once I asked her what she thought about my first book, um, and she said, uh, very quickly, she said, well, I like you, I like you. <laughs> and it, and it, for a moment, it really sounded as if she said, I like it, and I was kind of clinging on to the idea that she said, you like it, but no, I like you. You know, you're my, you're my eldest grandson, you know, so. Um, because there were kind of a lot of swear words and curse words in that book. And she also thought that I, sometimes that I kind of, um, that I didn't write the truth. She liked the truth and I should stick to the truth. That was her thing. Um, this, these thoughts and questions about memory and who we are without, without our memory, specifically I remember thinking, at some point, she will end, she will stop being my grandmother. So if she has 80% of her memories, of course she's my grandmother. If she has 40, yeah, she's, it's still her, right? I recognize her. But if she has 20, 5%, is that still her? Um, all these questions kind of trickle down into this latest novel that is called Everything I Don't Remember. Uh, in that novel, there is a grandmother who is losing her, um, memory and who's very upset that someone has taken her, taken her driving license. There's also a house that has been left. And, uh, but in the, in the center of the novel is a young man called Samuel. And uh, Samuel, uh, the book starts off with a car crash. Um, 
it's not at all a spoiler, but we find out very early on in the book that Samuel is dead. Samuel has taken his grandmother's car and he has driven it into a tree outside of Stockholm in an area called Vestbadia. Um, a writer who is a little bit reminiscent of the writer that you see in front of you right now, uh, hears about this car crash and becomes obsessed with trying to find out what really happened. So what was behind this car crash? Was it a suicide? Was it an accident? Was it due to the long relationship that Samuel had had with uh, Leide? Was it because of um, economic conflict with his friend Wanda? What happened? That's the mystery that drives this novel. So the writer starts contacting everyone who remembers Samuel and tries to ask them who Samuel really was. So we get to know his friends, his family, his neighbors. The plan is to try to map what happens, happened during Samuel's last day alive. The problem is that people are not really remembering th the same things. So there's kind of a friction between the different ideas of who Samuel was. For example, some people claim that in the story there is this kind of big love affair between Samuel and Lida. Some people say that that's, that was like a, you know, this kind of Hollywood version love affair, that that is what explained why he passed away. And according to Lida, who was the involved in this relationship, it was more like a fling. It was nothing. It was not as big thing as some people claim. So the different versions of this story are kind of being tested and being conflicted throughout the novel. And the more we read without like spoiling anything, I can say that the writer himself has kind of a secret agenda to why he wants to collect all these uh, memories. And uh, towards the end, we realize that maybe he and Samuel has uh, have more in common that he wants to reveal. Um, so in the center of the novel, there's Samuel, who uh, is a young man who is fast, super fascinated with memory. Especially, he's fascinated with how to make people remember him. So on the first date with Lida, he has this long argument where he says that the best way to get people to remember you is to make them associate you with a daily routine. Right? So if I'm going to make you remember me, I should make you associate, I should make you associate me with something that you do every day. And Lyda is a little bit, she doesn't really believe this theory. She said, well, the, the main thing if you want to remember someone is of course to create some kind of emotion. But Samuel is not too big on emotions. He more, he's more into like creating different systems of his own. So he says, well, the smartest thing for you to remember me, that would be if I can make you associate me with water. And then Samuel takes a glass of water and it, he pours it onto himself, kind of, with the ambition to kind of force her not to forget him. Um, another important person in the book is Lyda, who is the ex-girlfriend of Samuel's. And then the third important person is uh, his best friend, Vandad, who is a super loyal friend who some people claim that he does everything for money, but he says that he doesn't care about money. Um, but he's one of those persons who says that quite a lot. You know, people say like, well, I don't care about money. Money is nothing. Like, I don't care about like, it doesn't matter who pays or who doesn't pay. But in a way, you know, it's only money. But he keeps coming back to the issue of money throughout the novel. So these are the three characters. And then there, there's the grandmother, of course, who's losing her memory. Um, the form of the novel is structured in a way so that we're not totally sure 100% of the time who is speaking. And um, I've always enjoyed that feeling when I'm reading myself. I'm not really sure if the words that I'm being presented with, if they come from a man or a woman, or someone who's old or young, because that makes me kind of see my own preconceived ideas, my own prejudice. So in the novel, these different voices, these different memories of Samuel are being kind of, we're being thrown back and forth between different perspectives of this uh, person who is not um, alive anymore. Do you have Lego here in the States? Yeah. Lego? I was a big, <laughs> I love that reaction. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> So Lego, when I was a kid, I was a big Lego fan. 
right? And I know that's a very tired metaphor for like constructing something, but that's like, I, that is my feeling. When I encounter a book that I really love, my feeling is that I'm being presented with some kind of like big sea of Lego bits, and it's up to me to put them together. That um, hopefully if this novel works, that is the feeling that I want you to have, to like, that you are the ones who are kind of creating Samuel, and hopefully that gives you some kind of feeling that Samuel exists in a 3D form. Um, there is another character in the novel who's not, who is voiceless, and that character is my hometown, Stockholm. Um, I came back to Stockholm after having spent a few years abroad in 2010, and I felt my city had changed. One of the inspirations came from a, a friend of mine who uh, had a job one summer to drive one of those kind of tourist trains that looked like toys. Have you seen them? So it's like a, it looks like a, kind of like a, a huge toy train where tourists go on this train and he would drive the tourists around the highlights so they could see the highlights of Stockholm. And during this ride, they had a pre-recorded voiceover that said all these terrible cliches about st what Stockholm was, of course, like, oh, Stockholm, it's the Venice of the North, you know, uh, Stockholm, it's beautiful, Stock um, and it was up to my friend to kind of drive with the exact speed so that the, you know, voice met up with what they saw. Because what happens otherwise? Then we have a voice who's kind of dislocated, a voice that can come from anywhere. So his ambition was to drive. When we passed the rich area of Östermalm, the voice had to say, look, this is the affluent area of Östermalm. When the train crossed the bridge, the voice would say, wow, Stockholm, the Venice of the North, water everywhere. You know. And then the train would stop like on a high up on a hill. So you saw the beautiful view of Stockholm and the voice said, Stockholm. Look at her. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> and my friend said, I'm going crazy. <laughs> I will not take it. I hate that voice. <laughs> and I was like, what? why? Well, because it only tells one story. It tells the people who are visiting our city, one version of what we have in the city. Of course, there's a view, there's water, there's, there are areas that are very rich, but what about my neighborhood? Where are the experiences that I have of this city? So my friend was like, he kept saying this during the whole summer, he was like, one day, I'm gonna hijack that train. <laughs> I'm going to just take it, I'm just going to drive to the area where I grew up. So every time the voice says, wow, look, the most affluent area of Stockholm, <laughs> they would see his background. And whenever this, you know, if they would say, the voice would say, wow, it's the Venice of the North, they would see the mall, you know, where, where he uh, hung out in the weekends. Kind of. And do you think he did it? Do you think at one point he took that um, train and went for a joyride? Because what happens if you do that? You get fired, right? There are economic consequences of making that choice. So he kept saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to just wait one day, one day. And I was just like, have you done it? I'm gonna, Tuesday, I'm going to do it. Tuesday, <laughs> I'm just I'm waiting for the right day. Finally, he never did, did it, of course. He kept driving his route because it's very, to make that kind of rebellion you have to face consequences. And oftentimes, it's easier to make those kind of rebellions in theory than to do them in practice. Uh, so Stockholm was a big inspiration. When I came back to Stockholm, I had this idea. I had the feeling that my city had changed because everyone was talking about economy. That it was as if economy had kind of seeped into the veins of my, even my friends. I would sit with friends who I know were big book lovers. We normally, we talked about Calvino or Faulkner or Baldwin. And now all of a sudden, they were speaking about mortgages and how much they're going to invest in a certain apartment and how much they're going to sell it for and renovate it. And I remember thinking, that's never going to be me because I'm above economy, right? I deal with the high arts. <laughs> My book is for sale afterwards, just you know. 
No, but that's not part of me because I'm above. I have my own system. My own, I can just liberate myself with the use of my imagination. Then I became a father and I wrote this open letter um, that became a very viral thing in Sweden and that got a lot of love but also got a lot of uh, quite harsh attacks from certain right-wing um, powers in Stockholm. And all of a sudden I became the person who was focused on mortgages. All of a sudden I was the person who realized that if it comes to paying a price for security, I would be ready to do anything. If it's up to me to put my family in, like, in a secure place, I would pay anything to make that happen. So all of a sudden, I was like sitting there with, you know, comparing different interest rates and feeling economy entering my body, but also kidnapping my eyes. Because the city that I knew from growing up was not the city that I saw. All of a sudden, I saw a city full of potential investments, you know. <laughs> and I hated that part of me, but I could really see it happening. How kind of the numbers and the economy kind of, yeah, almost became part of my DNA. Um, so I think that's why the novel also deals a lot with economics. In the center, we have three people who are trying to get close to each other, but economy and numbers are kind of making that impossible, I would say. Um, so, with this book, I had kind of like a, it started off in a very light place. And I'm, now I'm going to do something which maybe it's not a good idea because I'm in Washington, D.C. But um, I, I, I'm trying to frame it in a way so you won't. Uh, uh, no, but when I, I'm going to say it like this. When my father, um, he had a big vinyl collection. And he had a lot of soul music in that um, collection, like Marvin Gaye, uh, Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin. And I remember listening to those records as a kid, really enjoying the music, but kind of thinking that the words were a little bit like lame, you know? <laughs> and here's like the, because isn't, I think Marvin Gaye is from Washington, right? Detroit. I'm sorry, you're, you're outnumbered. <laughs> the thing is, this book started with the ambition to write a very happy kind of love story. Um, and it started with an investigation of curiosity if I would be ready to actually write down cliches. Because when I was a kid, I remember listening to like, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough. Um, nothing can stop me from getting to you. And I kind of yawned and thought, that was, come on, Marvin, that's not, that's not how you write interesting fiction. Like, you have to, you have to use words that are more, um, that are not as lame, kind of. Uh, cliches don't work. Then I fell in love the first time. And I listened to the same song. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. And all of a sudden, I felt like, that's really true. <laughs> That's exactly what it feels like. <laughs> and of course, nothing had changed. The song was there. Um, the text was exactly the same, but I had changed. And when you're in these kind of strong emotional states, the cliches come alive. And I wanted to see if I would be ready to kind of actually write down what it feels to be in love. I wasn't sure if I would be able to do that. I wanted to try it. So that was the starting point of the novel, to write this kind of ain't no mountain high enough novel. Then life intervened. I was writing, I was having a grand old time, Lyda and Samuel met each other, Samuel poured the water over him. Fiction was being created. Um, but then, as I was writing, I had the experience of, uh, I had a friend who passed away while I was writing this book. And then all of a sudden, Everything, everything that I was writing felt uh, empty. There was no point in writing anymore. But my first reaction when I heard that call, when I got the call and said, she's not alive anymore, all right? My first impulse was, I'm gonna write her back. I'm gonna take everything I remember of that person and make her permanent through my memories, kind of. I wrote a short text, I read it at her funeral, did that make her come alive? No. 
was she in that text? Maybe a fragment of what was her was in that text, but she was not there. She was maybe even more void. The void of her maybe became even bigger the more I wrote about her, one could say. So I think that also influenced this novel because when a young person dies, what happens to everyone who's left, at least in my experience, is this giant question of what could I have done differently? And I think that's what all the characters in the book are dealing with. Like, could I have called more, called less? Um, what would have happened if I did so and so? So I think that's why the characters are also clinging on to their version of Samuel, because it's their way of, um, yeah, they were, maybe their way of convincing themselves that they did not do anything wrong. And the second thing that happened while I was writing was this experience that I started off with telling you about with my grandmother, when she, in a very quick, um, just a few months, started losing her memories. And um, in order for you to get some kind of idea, to, what I found interesting with that experience was that she always returned to the words and the numbers and her handwriting and even the expressions. Those became her kind of emergency exit. Those became the things that she clung on to in order to refine herself. So no matter how, when, before she, she became sick, she always used, she had this saying, um, she always used to say, I'm not stubborn. I'm not stubborn. I'm not stubborn. I'm not stubborn. But I never give in. <laughs> and that was very much her. So she starts losing her memories. The fog enters into her body, and she disappears. She's no longer the person that I remember, and she doesn't remember me. But even when she was in her home towards the end of her life, um, even when she was in a constant state of terror because she didn't recognize anyone or anything around her, that saying kept coming back. Like she said the same words, I'm not stubborn, I'm not stubborn, I'm not stubborn, but I never give in. So I would like to end with reading, actually I had the idea that I'm not going to read from the novel, I'm going to read from a short text that I um, kind of started off the novel. I think of this text as a rocket launcher, rocket launcher, or a rocket kind of, uh, rocket something uh, for the novel. <laughs> what is it called? The thing that is around the rocket. A, a launching pad, thank you. So th this is the launching pad of the novel. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's a short piece that I... Uh, uh, it started off with a newspaper in Sweden that wanted they, that asked me if I wanted to write like a review from a music uh, festival uh, in Sweden, mm. and um, um, I went to that festival. I borrowed my grandmother's car. I went to the festival, and then I came back, and then I couldn't write a review about the music festival because my heart was somewhere else. I was only thinking about the fact that my grandmother was slowly losing her memories. So instead of writing a review, um, I wrote a text called Grandma's Mitsubishi. Uh, the newspaper printed it, but they were a little bit confused. I think. <laughs> uh, they were like not 100% not amused, a little bit more confused. Um, but I, I, I'm going to experiment, try to read that text, and then uh, I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, uh, just, I will actually, I will read just a short section in Swedish because Swedish is my mother tongue and uh, just so you hear what it sounds like in Swedish. Uh, and then I will read the whole thing through in English and then we do questions. Jag åker hem till mormor för att lämna tillbaka bilen och vi sitter i hennes kök och dricker kaffe från den nya kaffebryggaren som bara kostade 200 kronor. 200! Trots att det är en Philips och Philips är ett bra märke för det är svenskt, säger mormor. Och ler så att guldplomberna i munnen glänser. I go to grandma's house to return her car and we sit in her kitchen and drink coffee from the new coffee maker that only cost 200 kroner. 200, even though it's a Philips. And Philips is a good brand because it's Swedish, grandma says, smiling so that her gold fillings in her teeth gleam. 
She's wearing her fluttery blue blouse and a per pearl necklace with matching earrings. And as long as she's sitting down, you don't think about how she only has one shoe and no skirt. But my skirt is around here somewhere. Hold on, I'll get it, Grandma says. And she gets up and walks over to the stove and stands there for a few seconds before she goes into the pantry and comes back with a big pack carton full of cookies. They've taken my driver's license, she says. And then we sit there in silence. We drink coffee and eat cookies and they taste almost exactly as I remember. I, so you can imagine that you're the newspaper agent, you know, kind of <laughs> waiting for some kind of festival action. But here it comes, just... I tell her about the music festival I went to in Gothenburg, James Blake's completely magical concert in Anna Dahl's church, Go Goosebumps, Prince's big show with purple confetti, dancing paints. I baked these cookies a long time ago, Grandma replies, long before they took my driver's license. I tell her about the high-energy Wiz Khalifa concert, hands in the air, and the super boring MF Doom session, your attack. But I'm not going to give up, Grandma says. I'm going to appeal. They can't lock me up in here. On the last night, we went to a kind of weird Kanye West concert, I say. Do you know who that is? Kanye West? Is he Japanese? Grandma asks. <laughs> no, American. He had like 20 female ballet dancers on the stage and an extravagant laser show and fireworks and smoke machines. But the only thing that was good about his show was when he accidentally showed he was human. Like when he lost his place during a memorized interlude about how important it is to follow your dreams. Or the time he sneaked a peek up at his image on one of the big screens to check himself out in the middle of a song. <laughs> then he was transformed from being a superstar to being a human being. But those people aren't human, Grandma says. Who? The people who took my driver's license. <laughs> And every time Grandma says those, she uses that tone that it's impossible to misunderstand. Those people, those damn people, those people who seem capable of absolutely anything, those people who cut pensions without remembering who it was who built this country, those people who don't have the slightest idea of how to impose order and control in school classrooms, those people who shut down the gas station on the corner and turned it into a graveyard for rusting ventilation ducts, yellow installation foam, and broken coffee, uh, coffee machines. And yet, the worst thing of all is that those people decided, with no warning whatsoever, that Grandma is no longer allowed to drive her own grey Mitsubishi. Why she has been driving for over 40 years and has never, ever been involved in an accident. But there have actually been a few accidents over the years, I say. <laughs> yes, of course, says Grandma, a few, but not very many, and none of them were fatal. <laughs> And that's true, Grandma is right, she's never been involved in a fatal accident, if you don't count the deer. But recently, <laughs> during the last few years, the number of minor incidents has increased more and more. Like the time Grandma picked up my brother from the airport in the countryside and turned out of the parking lot and then tried to drive straight through a roundabout. But it was extremely foggy that day. Or like the time Grandma got a hole in her fog light after running into a carelessly placed broom. Or the time Grandma was involved in three crashes in one year on the Liljeholm Bridge. But none of them were my fault, Grandma says, and I agree. The first time, there was an idiot who honked at her at a red light. And since she had dozed off, she became frightened and happened to run into the car in front of her. The second time she had ended up in the wrong lane and an idiotic bus driver refused to let her by. And the third crash wasn't even on the Liljeholm Bridge, it was just past it on the Orsta side. A deer was running alongside the road and suddenly without warning, the deer swerved to the left and flung itself across the hood of grandma's car. Some people, the witnesses, the insurance company, the police report, claim that grandma ran into the deer. She didn't. It was the deer that flung itself onto her car. You could almost call it a suicide attempt, Grandma says. 
because she could see that the deer had sad eyes, drooping antlers, and a general air of depression. When the coffee, uh, before I published this, I went to Grandma's house, I sat in front of her, and I read this text, because the whole point of this text is to get her to understand that she has to let us help her. Like she has done everything throughout her life, she's always helped us, but she can't ask for help. So the whole point of this text is just, you have to let us help you. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking that she's going to interrupt me and say something like, come on, that's, that's a little bit over the top, you know. That's like your first novel, kind of. But she stopped me after I was reading this with there. She stopped me and she put her hand on me, uh, her hand on mine, and she said, Jonas? I was like, yeah. That's the best thing you've ever written. <laughs> it was exactly like that. And it was. Like in her memory of that incident, it, it was exactly like that. Because if it had been any other way, she would be forced to sh change her idea of who she was and then things would get tricky. When the coffee is gone, we say goodbye and I hide the car keys where she can't find them way up high on the hat rack. Later that afternoon, she calls and asks when I'm going to come by with the car and whether I had fun at the music festival. She calls again that evening and asks if I'm coming by with the car soon. We can drink coffee, we can eat cookies. I'm curious to hear what it was like at that festival in Gothenburg. The next day, she calls at dawn and asks when I'm going to pick her up so we can drive up to Stockholm. She doesn't want to be in the country anymore. She wants to go home. She feels isolated. But Grandma, I say, you're already in Stockholm. You are home. Can't you tell? You're calling me from your regular home number. You're lying in your regular old bed. And if you just look a little to the right, you can see a regular old nightstand with the old Vademekum bottle and the glass of water and the tattered Bible and the blinking clock radio. And right next to the bed is the note you've written to yourself. Your beautiful, ornate handwriting that says, I am in Stockholm. I'm not going anywhere. And Grandma finds the note and reads the words and says, Ah, oh, I guess I'm starting to get a bit nutty. And we hang up and are persuaded by self that my memories are eternal and I will never need to write something down for it to remain with me. My phone is quiet for 10 minutes before it rings again and it's grandma wanting to know when I'm coming by to drop off the car and how it went at that music festival in Gothenburg. And I say the music festival was totally wicked and magical and I'm so glad you decided to come along. It was so fun to see you rocking out to Prince Hits and clapping in time with Wiz Khalifa. And I'm sure you remember, you remember, right, how the audience in that church cheered when you climbed up on stage to sing the second verse, verse of James Blake's encore song, right? And Grandma is quiet for a few seconds. And then she says, oh, now you, you're just making things up. <laughs> but you can hear that she is smiling. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to ask them. So I'm being told by a sign that we have five minutes, if there are any questions or... I wanted to say that I love what you say about memory and when we're losing our memory, I watched my mother go through that. And I just think that the, all the different ways you looked at it and the ways that you look up what make, looked at what makes up a human being from all the perspectives is just very moving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, yes. I was uh, intrigued by what you said about uh, returning to Stockholm and uh, the emphasis on the economy. And I was wondering uh, how you've seen uh, economic issues impact not only your own work, but the work of other uh, Swedish novelists who are your contemporaries, and why you think those might be uh, so present as a theme. Um, I think that that's a great question. I, I, um, I think maybe I had, uh, I was more, I was quite, how should I put it, I'm, I'm a failed economist. 
um, like I have studied econ economy when I was uh, young and I never graduated, which my father reminds me about every 10 minutes. Um, but I, I've always been fascinated with the kind of the power that money can give you. And I think the, the money, uh, the power and the privilege that money can give you. Can give you. Um, so since I became a father, I had this kind of theme almost. My latest play was called Almost Equal To. And that also deals with economy and kind of um, the challenges of Knowing that, we, knowing that there's a system that has all these negative consequences, but not really knowing how to formulate an alternative. Um, and I think that I, before I became a father, I think I had this idea that I, I could be free to create in my uh, fictional universe. Um, but I think becoming a father, I think I realized that my idea of economics were quite, was quite uh, simplified, actually, that, that it was very tricky to create this kind of uh, separate universe from, from uh, yeah, the, the everyday reality in Stockholm. And um, like the main shift that has happened in Stockholm is that we, in the latest 10 and 20 years, we've changed the whole housing market. So, um, we've gone from a rent-based system to now we can actually invest in housing, which um, creates all these, all kinds of interesting consequences, not only for the people who have, like I, I had the luxury of being able to find a secure place for my family, but it was also interesting to see how that changed my view of my own city. Because if you have the illusion that you can own a part of a physical space, the people who don't have that ability you start seeing them as with um, a suspicion that I was, um, yeah, that I, th I didn't think that I was capable of that, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, how long did it take you to write the book? And how do you find the strength to write again when your friend dies and you feel empty? How do you uh, move on and keep writing? Do you stop? How do you, um, I guess, get to starting and completing a book? Um, well, this one was trickier than the other ones, actually. Um, and I think it has had to do with that feeling that I've... So I've been writing all my life. That has been my main joy. Like, the best drug I know is to just to go home and to write and to... Um, I've never doubted the value of words, but having that loss in my life for the first time, it was as if I kind of doubted what words could do, actually. Um, and um, I don't think I have a... Um, the one thing that, that got me out of that hole of feeling like doubting what words could do was just to to realize that um, even though they couldn't, how should I put it, even though they, could, they couldn't recreate the person who was gone, um, the feelings that I had of having lost her were able to capture, I was able to put that on a page. And that, there were many things that happened after having lost her that I thought um, would be tricky to put in, in um, in prose. Um, one thing well, that was weird to me that we all know if we lose someone, that person is gone. But the strange thing was that even though she was gone, she was present everywhere. So I kept seeing her everywhere. I kept just speaking about memories, like the amounts of memories that kept coming up that we had shared was just uh, endless. Um, so the only way I had, the only way I could deal with that was to try to write myself out of it. and, and um, um, yeah, in the end, it became this book, but, but uh, okay. now I'm seeing a sign that says wrap up, and I'm guessing that <laughs> that means that we are done. So thank you very much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.